Portland Roasting established direct relationships with the people they buy coffee from and even help them to improve their farms and their lives. They call it Farm Friendly Direct. <laughs> Hi, I'm here today with Mark Stell, owner of the Portland Roasting Company. Mark, thank you very much for having Sustainable Today in. Thanks, Eugene. Appreciate you being here. When did roasting, uh, Portland Roasting Company get started? Um, well, we started in 1996. Uh, there was th basically three of us that started the company. I'm the last survivor. <laughs> uh, I have a couple other partners now, but uh, we started um, basically in uh, the, the early part of 96, where I used to work for somebody and decided it was a good time to do my own thing. I could do it a little better and uh, actually try to improve on what somebody else started. Did you initially start with fair trade in mind? Um, no. Uh, my initial reason for starting the company was based on uh, beginnings in sustainability. I started in 92. I was a delegate at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. I was one of two official delegates to attend that conference. And out of that conference came kind of my desire to build a sustainable company. Quite honestly, um, the fair trade model for us um, never really fit quite uh, as well as it probably does with other companies. When you look at a fair trade model, they're basically just providing a premium to farmers. And um, that premium is typically uh, minimal. So when you're looking at issues like um, hunger in coffee lands, uh, uh, women empowerment issues, any of the Millennium Development Goal issues, none of those except for uh, extreme poverty is actually touched. And um, what we do is actually try to facilitate some of those other needs uh, through our program. When we go into Tanzania or Kenya, for example, and we're, we're doing a water project, like a water well, we've, we've partnered with somebody um, to drill the hole and we've paid for the solar water pump or a merry-go-round solar combination water pump. When we get there, you realize that um, most of the people here are either at poverty levels or below poverty level. Uh, probably, I'd say a good 30% of the people are below poverty level, so below a dollar a day, or extreme poverty, I should say. And, you know, you just look at the basic things. I mean, these people, could, they need seeds to grow food. They need all kinds of assistance because there is no government assistance in most of these countries, even though a lot of East Africa is subsistence living. Um, there's just nothing provided by the government. Even clean water, you just, they don't have access to it. So when you go in and you do a little project like what we do, um, where we can provide water or educational opportunities, um, you always see a need for other, other things to give. I mean, we, we, we built a school three years ago at one place and we found ourselves two years later doing a book drive because they didn't have any books. So you just always see that, you know, there's always something. In Ethiopia, we hired um, Mercy Corps to do a community assessment before we walked into the place. And um, we basically went into Yerga Chefe, uh, high up in the mountains and outside of uh, Addis Ababa and said, you know, we want to buy from this community. Could you please assess what they need before we go in, before we start talking pricing and things like that? Because we wanted to understand what their needs were. And they came back with a, a, a great report that said, here are the top 10 things that the community needs. One thing was water. The second thing was a road. Um, and the third thing was a bridge, you know, it was like, you know, infrastructure that it's just not available. And, you know, you think water, they need to survive off water. It's high altitude. Um, and there's just not a lot of uh, port potable water or drinking water there. In um, Guatemala, where we did a water treatment facility. Three years before we got there, a hurricane had wiped out her entire wet mill. And in the process, um, they didn't have any way to treat contaminated water once it was finished with their coffee process. They were just letting it go back into a stream. And this particular coffee farm was at a, the highest level of this mountain range, so everything downstream was being contaminated. So all the water that what people were drinking, um, any type of animals were consuming this water product. So we thought instantly, well, this is, we, this is a direct need. Let's just figure out how to pay for this. We paid for it up front and then financed it over the next three years of coffee purchases. When you have um, somebody who's paying a lot of money for your coffee and saying, we'd like to see this, you know, and, and give them the opportunity, things change, and actually it changes for the better. What exactly is Farm Friendly Direct? Our Farm Friendly Direct program was designed um, almost immediately when we started the company. We wanted to buy direct from a farm, know who we were buying from, and actually set it up as a long-term supply chain management program. What it turned out to be was 
uh, was exactly that, but also more, because we found something that um, I believe helps with creating some form of passion in the workplace other than what your core product is. We feel a passion for the product, but also a passion to help the people we're buying from. And, and it's always been based on us paying not only a fair trade price, but a premium above that to pay for a project. And usually the project's based on Millennium Development Goals. So whether you're talking about um, extreme hunger or uh, developing a sustainable uh, livelihood in their community to women empowerment issues or um, pretty much any, anything uh, that's related to the Millennium Development Goals. Even though you raise the bar on what would be considered fair trade, do you uh, have an effect on the mainstream coffee corporations? Yeah, actually, I think we have a very big impact. We're, we are the last coffee company to receive this global sustainability award from the coffee industry. It was because of our farm-friendly direct practices. And when we started out doing our direct purchasing program, um, we realized that we were setting kind of an industry trend by buying direct and actually not just buying direct but getting involved. And we're now seeing companies like Duncan and um, Starbucks and um, some of the other, uh, Green Mountain does a great job, I think, with their, their direct uh, purchasing programs and, and some of their Millennium Development Goal projects. Um, and we're starting to see, you know, that that's mainstream to me is, is those large companies when they get involved. We were the um, originators of the Walk, Portland Walk for Water event. Um, it's, it happens every year around World Water Day. It's usually the Sunday before or after World Water Day. This will be our third year. Um, because of the success, we rolled it into a nonprofit. Uh, it's, it's a separate entity now. It's called Portland Global Initiatives, and um, uh, have a have a, a, a newly formed board of directors. And we're raising money for this water project. And Portland Roasting has been the main sponsor, and will continue to be the main sponsor. And essentially, what our staff does is gets involved in this uh, event once a year, and we raise money through. Um, simulating what it's like for a young African woman to walk for water every day. The kids are the ones that are ex do quite well. And I, I, I struggled. I was with the ambassador from Tanzania that was here for the event. And <laughs> both of us really struggled to carry this bucket because it's actually quite hard. You know, and, and, and you know, those kids are 13 years old carrying a bucket that's full of water on their head for three miles. That's, that's in incredibly difficult. Um, and the moment people kind of get that, they pick up the bucket that's full, they're like, I can't do this for three miles. This is crazy. You know, why are you making me do this? Or why am I doing this? And then they start getting it. It's not easy. Just trying yeah, to live. Hard. It's heavy. Considering they yeah, have to do heavy. it every day. I can't imagine walking even this far. People walk even farther. I can't imagine. Just like, that's not even all the way full. And yeah. if it was, my arm would hurt even more. <laughs> so I can't imagine having to do that every day. So we make people and we ask people to carry a bucket of water three miles is a simulated effort. And then in return, give us 20 bucks and we'll send it off to a nonprofit or an NGO in Africa to do a well. And so we, we basically raised over the last couple of years uh, almost $45,000, three different wells in three different areas of uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, and we'll do it again next year. It's transformational. That's, that's the word I would use. Transforms their lives completely. Uh, because look, the time they would use to go to work three, four miles to get water, they will do something more productive. If they're girls, they would be going to school rather than going to fetch water. Uh, the hygiene that comes from having access to clean water uh, protects people against disease. You know, it's, it's, it's huge, it's huge. It's a transformation. What is the best way to communicate to your consumers that they're truly getting what is a fair trade coffee? The proof is in what we provide to our customer. I think the best way is to show them pictures, show them video of actually the projects we've completed. And in the, in the end, I think that's why we've done so well, is because of showing them that actual work. A lot of companies out there that do greenwashing, that do kind of stuff, but when they're not showing something, it's easy to be to criticize what they're doing. We feel that we can provide a, a product that's paid for well from our, from our vendors, and, and, and also our consumers aren't going to get you know, charged extra because of it. We, we, we uh, position ourselves where we're not the highest priced coffee in the market. We think we're one of the best. In the last five years running, we've been rated number two in the country for, through Roast Magazine for our quality and sustainability. So I mean, we, we know we have great coffee, but there's no reason to overcharge for it. I mean, we, we feel that that's our value. It's like having values and providing value. You know, that's kind of like a, it's not our motto, but it, it actually makes kind of what we do valid. It is the one industry that will, I think, 
either make or break long-term sustainability in, in, around the world. Um, it's not oil, I can tell you that. We have more people employed uh, than any other place, on any other industry on the planet. So everything begins with, I guess, at the base of, of the coffee industry. If you get the growers and all the growers that are around the world believing in that they need to plant trees and they need to grow sustainably and they need to um, watch the soil erosion, that kind of thing, everything go comes from that. Well, Mark, thank you very much for allowing Sustainable Today to have a look at how you run your business, and it was very fascinating. Pleasure, Eugene. Anytime. Thank you. I'm Eugene Dendas, bringing you the tools to be sustainable today.